Well, we're going to do something a little bit different this evening, and that uh, we're going to, um, if you listen to my radio broadcast, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I always, uh, I usually divide my radio broadcast up with music, and so tonight that's what we're going to do, and we're going to go through the message as we go through. We're going to stop at different places, and we're going to sing, so you could open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Now, you don't need to stand each time, so we'll let you remain seated as we go through this. Uh, but we'll sing a couple other times throughout the message tonight, all right? So Luke chapter 2, and uh, we're going to continue on a little bit. Luke 2 and verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. It had been a week since the baby had arrived and arrived in the dark of the night. Today was the eighth day. The birth had been uneventful, so to speak. Thankfully, there had been no complications in the delivery. It had also been seven days since those shepherds had rushed in upon them, all out of breath, all talking at once. Words tumbled out, the story of an angel, then many angels filling the skies with praise to God. They had come to see their Savior. They were very kind, rather timid once they all came in. Mary could hear their excited voices as they left, praising God for seeing her baby and then scattering in all directions. They could hardly wait to tell others the news, and Mary's heart was filled with wonder. If you look at verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now as she sat baby in her arms, Mary reviewed all of those events that led to the life-changing events seven days before. It, of course, had begun back in their hometown of Nazareth when she was startled by the sudden appearance of an angel named, well, he called himself Gabriel. His voice was kind, but there was no doubting the authority with which he spoke. In Luke chapter 1, we read these words, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And then verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. Mary had left the region and gone to visit her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who was with child, a very special child. And Mary had stayed with her until the birth of John. What a noble-sounding name that was. And upon her return, Mary had been forced to meet with Joseph, the love of her life. There was no hiding her condition now, and although she was excited and anxious to share with him the wonderful news She understood how unbelievable her story would be. And poor Joseph, how devastated he was. Of course he did not understand. His heart was broken. But then a night or two later, Joseph came banging on the door. He too had been met by an angel. And they would be married right away and would leave the opinions of the neighbors in God's hands. All of this was such an amazing display of the grace of Jehovah. After all these years, the Messiah was finally going to arrive. And they, well, they were very much included in it all. And then the decree came. A census for tax purposes. And all the timing, she was almost due to be delivered. But off they went, trudging down the road to Bethlehem, some 115 kilometers away. And once in town, they they quickly realized that there was no available lodging for them. And, well, that's how they ended up in the stable. At least they were out of the weather. Well, in those eight days, Joseph had decided it would be best for them to stay in Bethlehem for a short term. He had found them a place, and they would move soon, and there was talk of work for him. She had no doubts because he was a good carpenter, and she was proud of her new husband. Seven days had passed, and an important day was upon them and at hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness, and thank you, Lord, as we finish these few verses that deal with the story of Christmas. Lord, may they encourage and challenge our our hearts tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Hymn 236, What Child Is This? (laughs) 
Hymn number 236, you can remain seated for this one. Hymn number 236, What Child Is This? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King, in whom shepherds guard. <coughs> haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean? Estate where ox and ass are feeding. Good Christian, fear for sinners. Hear the silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King. Shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the <coughs> three on the last. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Compass and king to own him, the king of kings, salvation. <coughs> Throne him. This, this is Christ, the king whom shepherds. Lord and angel sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Luke describes the circumcision of Christ in one simple sentence. Verse 21, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. It was important to circumcise the baby Jesus because circumcision was commanded of God in Genesis 17. And it would identify God's son with those he would call his people. Circumcision was the token of membership within the covenant relationship of the nation. And even though he was born of Abraham, even though he was of the royal lineage of David, until he had undergone this rite of circumcision, he would not be considered an Israelite. But there was another significance on this eighth day after his birth. On the day of circumcision, he was officially named and he was named Jesus which means Jehovah is salvation. Now, yes, most people today in 2017 what Jesus means, and certainly they really have no idea. However, for those of us who have found forgiveness and new life through his name, there really is no other name like it. It is truly the name above all other names. Now, Jesus is simply the Greek rendering of the Old Testament name Joshua, a great leader of Israel. Originally, Old Testament Joshua's name was just simply Ashua, which means salvation. But his friend and mentor Moses had added to his name and called him Jehoshua, which was later shortened to Joshua. Well, the name Jesus declares salvation and deliverance, a work of great power. And both Joseph and Mary had had clear instruction from an angel on separate occasions 
And so there really was no question to them what it was that God wanted the child to be. I imagine Joseph and Mary had discussed the matter many times leading up to the birth, often in the seven days since. They would be certain to follow the angel's instruction. Now, Jesus was not an uncommon name. Joshua was a hero in Israel, so many people were named Jesus. But when it came time, think about this, when it came time to announce and declare the name of the child, I think the, the moment for them might have overwhelmed them. This child is Jehovah's salvation. After 40 days, Mary and Joseph were ready to fulfill another requirement for newborns and their mothers. It was an offering of purification, verse 22. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The law stipulated clearly what was to be brought for a woman after the birth of a child. Now, we'll not take time tonight to return to Leviticus chapter 12, but they're told that they're to bring a lamb unless they were poor, exceptionally poor. And if they were poor, then they were allowed to bring these turtle doves. So Mary and Joseph's humble offering was a public admission of their financial status. And it reveals once again the complete humility of the Lord Jesus in coming to this earth. He grew up wearing the coarse clothing of the poor, eating the simple diet of the poor. There was no special treatment for God's Son manifest in flesh. They came also to present him to the Lord, uh, really to give him back to God, to de dedicate him. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 2, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Now, the original purpose of this was God had determined that he would accept the firstborn of everything that was born. If it was an animal, it was to be sacrificed. If it was a child, it was to be given back to him so that God would raise up from them, really, a, a nationhood of priests. That means every home would have a priest living within it. But Israel had failed to live up to that, and so the Lord instead took the tribe of Levi to be his servants in the priesthood. But Mary and Joseph were bringing this unique child, this son, to present him to the Lord really after that original commandment, that command that God had said, bring me the firstborn that is born of woman. Now, we know today that many years later, of course, the Lord Jesus became our faithful high priest. And he certainly was touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was tempted in all points like as we are. But praise God, yet without sin. Well, this short trip to Jerusalem must have been very exciting for the young family, one filled with determination. Each step of the path that they walked was graced by God. He had shown them his will, and they had been blessed to obey and to follow it. And the lives of this young couple will forever stand, I believe, as examples of humble surrender and obedience and grace. Let's turn in our songbooks to 208. We're going to sing two songs. They're going to follow each other, 208 and 209, with a short, just a quarter or two transition in between them. But we'll allow you to remain seated as we sing.
day spring come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here disperse the gloomy clouds of night and test dark shadows put to flight Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, Israel. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our continue on here in the gospel of Luke and let's go to verse 25 and behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him so here we're introduced to Simeon a man like Zacharias an old man it seems a very old man, and he was a kindred spirit with Zacharias, different than many others in his nation. You see, while many of his fellow Israelites had fallen into, I guess we could say, the rituals of life, a carnal lifestyle, a backslidden lifestyle, he was a man that sought to know God and to follow his path. And his testimony that God gives to us in his word is really inspiring and revealing of the condition of his heart. Notice it tells us that whose name was Simeon, the same man was just and devout. Well, just basically means righteous, observant of the divine law, innocent. This was a man whose whole way was uh, uh, thinking and acting was conformed to the will of God. And he was a man that was approved of God. And he was devout. To be devout means to take hold of something. In this case, to take hold of the things of God. The word means that he was, yes, a religious man, a pious man. 
The original of the word means a man of good reputation, well received, of high standing amongst the people. Really, I think we, you and I would say today that Simeon was a man that was very serious about his walk with God. He was diligent to keep the law of God as best as he could. And those times when he failed, and he did, and sinned, he brought his sacrifices and the offerings that God had stipulated to restore, restore and find atonement for that sin in his life. I sometimes wonder if that could be said about us. Are we devout? Now, not by the world standards. To be devout in the world standard is if you go to church once a month. Boy, that's really devout. No, but to be devout as God saw this man from the inside out. Not only that, but notice it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And that phrase simply means this, that he was somebody who was anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. He was a man that was looking forward to the Messiah. Now, the problem is, is that Israel as a nation had grown weary of waiting for the Messiah. Oh, they would talk about it. It was mentioned, and certainly it was something that was said often in their synagogues, but rarely did the anticipation of the Messiah impact individual hearts and lives of the people, which really is in some ways strange because, you know, the coming of the Lord had been clearly prophesied, Not only were the details given, but there was also even a time frame that was given to them. That's how the wise men figured out that the star in the sky was symbolic of something, and they determined from their research that it had to be the birth of the king of the Jews. And yet, only a very few seemed to be looking for his arrival. You know, sometimes I think that you and I lose sight of the second coming of our Lord and Savior. You know, it's been very long, and our lives have become so filled with waiting for lots of other things, lots of other events like Christmas or a vacation. I wonder if the Lord would look at our hearts as he did the church at Thessalonica and say concerning them that they were looking for the Lord's return. But also there's something unusual about Simeon. It says in verse 25, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, we've talked much about the different economies and the operation of the Holy Spirit. We know that today, you and I, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Bible tells us that God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of us. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God. That's a wonderful thing. He's the down payment on our heaven, and we can rejoice in that. But in the Old Testament economy, we can say, The Holy Spirit only came upon people for special jobs and special tasks and special events. Simeon's day, he yet lived under that Old Testament setup. And yet the Bible says that the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, I guess we could liken this today to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Though I'm indwelt by the Spirit of God, God calls upon me to be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? I know some people say, well, that's sort of like a, an extra experience. Something miraculous happens and some you know, great rush comes upon you. No, being filled with the Spirit is simply you and I stepping out of the way and saying, Holy Spirit, you take control. You guide my thoughts today. You take care of my speech today. You give me the grace that I need. We are commanded in Ephesians to be filled with the Spirit. But again, I must wonder, do I surrender to the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you consciously addressed God, the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, and you said, Lord, fill me today. Help me to be your messenger. Help me to be your servant. Help me to be, as Simeon was, filled with the Spirit. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see uh, see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. I think we are safe to say that Simeon was nearing the end of his life. Some have estimated that he might have been nearly a hundred years old. And the Holy Spirit of God revealed to this just and devout man that the day for which he had waited so long was drawing near. Simeon, you can take heart. God was going to let him see the Lord's Christ before he died. So he was going to get to see the Messiah of Israel. Early one morning, lying in bed just about to get up, he sensed a special impression from the Lord. Simeon, I want you to go up to the temple today. Something special is going to happen. Verse 27 says, And he came by the Spirit into the temple. 
You know, can you picture what's taking place here? I think that Simeon that morning got up early in the morning and he realized the Holy Spirit had prompted him and said, this is going to be a special day. You need to go. And I think Simeon got up and began to get dressed and put on his, his good clothes and not the regular ones he would wear during the week. And he got them on and, and he began to sort of comb his hair and you know comb out his beard and got his very best on. As was the norm, I imagine that he lived with his extended family. And I'm sure the kids were wondering, you know, Mom, what's up with great-grandpa? He's, he's, he's up and he's bustling around and he's doing rushing around. Where is he going? Maybe the mom would look around and say, I, I don't know. He does seem intent on something. Grandpa, are you okay? Yes, I, I, I'm fine. I must get to the temple. This is a, a, a special day. See you later. I'll tell you all about it. Simeon made his way as fast as his old legs could carry him. I'm sure his friends called to him along the way, but he had no time for idle chat. No, God had given him instructions, and he was not going to miss out on anything. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. I don't know if the Lord told Simeon exactly what to look for. Was the Messiah a grown man? How would he appear? And I just sort of imagine Simeon there in the temple courtyard, his, his eyes searching, his looking through the crowds, wondering it was. He knew what God had told him was going to happen, and he's looking. And, and, and as he looks around, his eyes searching the crowds, his gaze fell upon this young couple coming through the courtyard. The young man had strong arms from a rigorous lifestyle, and he was carrying a small cage containing two turtle doves. And the young wife at his side held this little young baby, and, and they were new parents, and she was coming to complete the days of purification. He had seen it numerous times uh, to bring an offering for herself and to present their child to God. But suddenly he knew <laughs> this was it. The Spirit prompted him and nudged him forward. This is not just any baby. This was the promised one of Israel, the long-awaited Messiah. I picture Simeon scooting across that courtyard as best he could and as fast as his legs would take him to, to intercept them. And as he drew near, they smiled. You know how new parents are. They got a new baby, and somebody comes up and takes notice, and they're always going to respond. They, they like that. And, and then he says to them, may I? May I? And I see Mary looking at Joseph and Joseph nodding. And the old man picks up that baby and he begins to speak. Oh, praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, how long we have waited. Finally, you have sent the Messiah. Verse 28, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles <coughs> and the glory of thy people Israel. Honestly, what more can we add to these precious words? So simple and yet so profound. He said, Lord, I can die now. Let me depart in peace. And why not? He held the Prince of Peace in his hands. And this child was not just a part of God's salvation. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. We need to understand that the child that he held, it, that was all of God's salvation. Jehovah's salvation was here, wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. And I would point out to you that this elderly Jewish man had a wonderful understanding as to the extent of God's salvation through his son, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Not only was Israel in view, but all of the human race, and he was truly the Savior of the world. Well, Joseph and Mary were amazed at his words. Verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. 
you know, they had expected, I'm sure, the, the usual, you know. Oh, what a cute boy. You know, what did you name him? And all that kind of stuff. Instead, they heard praise to God and a prayer of thanksgiving. Truly, as we sang a moment ago, what child is this? And then in an odd turn of events, the old man directs his attention to this young couple, especially Mary. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, and the thoughts of many hearts, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He said, Mary, you must understand that not all the world, even not all of Israel, would welcome this child as Simeon had welcomed him. Indeed, he would be a stumbling block to Israel. Many would fall because of their sin-hardened hearts and refusal to accept him as Lord and Savior. And then he said, prepare yourself, young lady. You're going to experience pain in all of this too, like a sword through your soul. And one day, some 30 years, Three years later, the same Mary would stand on the outskirts of that city of Jerusalem and watch as angry crowds took the Messiah, her son, by birth and crucified him. And then the Bible cuts off without another word of Simeon. And we are introduced to another godly person, a woman named Anna. 223, a song born to die. In 223, we'll sing the first, the third, and the last hymn number 223. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were fading, or the place where he lay. Fell a shadow cold and gray Of a cross that would humble a king Born to die upon Calvary Jesus suffered my sin to forgive Born to die upon Calvary was wounded that I might live on the third verse from his throne Jesus came laid aside heaven's fame in exchange for the cross of Calvary for my gain suffered loss for my sin he bore the cross he was wounded and I was set free. Born to die upon Calvary. Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary. He was wounded that I might live. Dearest Lord, evermore, may thy cross I adore as I follow the path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to Thee. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, was wounded that I might live. 
Well, we know from the other gospel accounts that Joseph and Mary remained in Bethlehem for a period of time. Long enough for the wise men to be able to make their journey. We feel that as Matthew gives us the account, that uh, indeed uh, he was a young child by that time. They were located in a house. Time enough for the wise men from the east to come and worship the young child, and they stayed long enough. Time enough for Herod to go insane with jealousy and ordered the murder of all baby boys around Bethlehem. And they fled into Egypt. Eventually, they did return to Israel, to the region of Galilee, back to their hometown of Nazareth, where the now toddler Jesus grew until he was 12-year-old Jesus. And then the scripture is silent for another 18 years until the start of the Lord's public ministry. You know, the story of Christmas is really all about fulfilled prophecy. The miracle of the virgin birth, the angelic messengers, the shepherd, the wise men, the wonderful star. It's all about Jesus coming in flesh, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. But it's also the story of a young woman, pure in her virginity, confronted with really very amazing news and humbly submitting herself to do the will of God. And it's a story about an upstanding young man who sees his dreams dashed into pieces and then resurrected in a most amazing way. A noble young man who also commits himself to obey and to do the will of God for his life and for that of his new bride. And it's a story of an old man. I like that. One that held on to his faith in spite of God's long delay. But when the fullness of time was come, Simeon's faith was made sight, and he, first of all others, was able to hold God's salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And this story, the greatest story ever told, is a story for you and me. It makes us consider our own submission to God, our own faith, our own willingness to press on even when it seems like sight will never come. And it is living with that eager anticipation that God is coming. You ever stop to think about all those who did not share in Simeon's dream when he went back and said, hey, told all of his friends, I've seen the Messiah? I don't know if there was a twinge in their hearts. We missed it. We were not looking for him. We were not ready for him. Their lives were too filled with their own busyness to look and to wait for the Savior. I really believe that Jesus is coming soon. And I want to be found waiting for him and looking for him. Because you know what? He could come tonight. Matthew tells us, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. We're going to stand this time. We'll sing our last song, 217. A song that we don't often sing, but it's got a tremendous message to it. It's called In the Bleak Midwinter. In the Bleak Midwinter. Follow carefully as you sing these words, 217. In 217, we'll sing all three verses. 217. In the bleak midwinter Frosty wind made moan, person hard as iron, water like a stone, snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow, in the bleak midwinter. Long, long ago, heaven cannot hold him, nor the earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. God himself be.
Jesus Christ. Why?